So I took Meersfeinchen because someone asked me to, and um, I hope you like the uh, like the break. Um, I, but welcome back. So we will be talking about secondary structures and a little bit more. Um, but um, the thing about primers is is that they work in pairs, right? Yeah, rec I'm recording, so I, I press record. So primers work in pairs. So you have a forward and a reverse primer, right? And both are used in the PCR reaction. So you need to ensure that besides them not being able to either hybridize to each other, you also have to make sure that they are suitable for the reaction. Um, and that means that the melting temperature and their annealing temperature cannot vary too much. You cannot have a forward primer that is 30 base pairs long, has an annealing temperature of like 63 degrees, and a reverse primer which is only 20 base pairs long and has an annealing temperature of like 50 degrees. Because that won't work. So the critical feature here is, is that if you are designing primers, um, then their maximum difference in annealing temperature is kind of 3 degrees Celsius. If, if there's a bigger difference than 3 degrees Celsius, uh, this is not going to work. So the closer their annealing temperatures are to each other, the better your primers will work. Um, and generally you want to be within 3 degrees Celsius, because if you're like outside of three or uh, if you're like 5 or 6 degrees Celsius difference, uh, then your PCR reaction might still work, but your yield will be very low. So hey, the amount of DNA that you get will just be lower than what you would normally get. All right, so very basic summary of primer design is um, make sure that your primer is unique, that it only binds to the target DNA that you want to amplify and not to other DNA which might be floating around um, and especially human DNA if you're not working on humans. So if you're or if you're working on, on plants, make sure that your primer does not bind to humans. Uh, the length um, of a primer needs to be between 17 and 28 base pairs, um, but this varies and uh, you can go a little bit longer and you can go a little bit shorter. Of course, the shorter you go, the less the uniqueness will be or the, the harder it will be to find a primer which is unique. Um, the base pair composition needs to be around 50 to 60 percent. You need to avoid long stretches of A's and T's and G's and C's. So you cannot really amplify like repeats in the genome. Um, you need to optimize base pairing to minimize false priming. So hey, like I told you guys, you have to have a low stability at the three prime end. And this is just because the polymerase won't work when the, D or when the primer is tightly bound to the, to the template DNA. Uh, the melting temperature of your primer needs to be between 55 and 80 degrees Celsius. Generally, you don't want to have it above 70 degrees Celsius. Um, but like as a rule of thumb, if the melting temperature of your primer is between 55 to 80 degrees, um, you should be able to have a successful PCR reaction. Um, because primers work in pairs, um, you have to have their annealing temperatures to be very similar, um, but never design or never order a primer pair uh, when the difference between the annealing temperature is more than 3 degrees Celsius. Um, and you have to minimize internal structures, um, so you have to avoid uh, hairpins and dimers, right? So they, those should not occur. A primer should not be able to bind to itself. It should not be able to fold back on itself because that will just make your PCR reaction not work. All right, so advanced primers. So advanced primers are primers where um, you are doing multiple things in one go. Um, for example, if you use multiplex PCR, then you are using primers to not just amplify a single region of the genome, but you're amplifying, for example, multiple parts of the genome. Um, or you're, for example, trying to amplify not just one virus, but a whole family of viruses. Um, you have universal primers, you have semi-universal primers, and you have gasmers. So we will go through these four primer structures, or the, to these four primer designs. Um, and this is relatively advanced and uh, normally you would not be able to, to do that. Especially Gesmers nowadays, like I think that no one really designs Gesmers anymore because sequencing is so cheap that you don't have to guess anymore. However, um, in the past um, I designed a whole bunch of Gesmers, which is really fun. Alright, so multiplex PCR is when you have multiple primer pairs in the same tube. Right? So you want to amplify two parts of the genome. Um, so you want to amplify gene X and you want to gene amplify gene Y in the same go. Um, and 
Yeah, I'm sorry, Commando. I, I, I think it broke. I think you can't use the wizard command at the moment. Let me see if I can uh, if I can reset my overlay. Uh, let me let me do that. Um, oh no, yeah, yeah, no. I I made a coding bug. So every time that I, I that I go away, yeah, yeah. Don't don't throw it all in the chat and like wait for me to reset the thing. Uh, so let me um, do properties. Do this, then okay, and then I get a 404 page not found, and I do properties, and I go back to this page, then I say okay, then I have to interact with the thing, and I have to click the login button. Have you tried turning it off and on again? All right, so I turn it on again. So now it should work. So does it work? Yes, it works. <laughs> so now you can use your, your wizard and your hard eyes and these kinds of things again. <laughs> I like it. It's just so silly, but it's, it, it, it's something which is fun. All right, so I have multiple primers in the same tube. So we do this sometimes, and we sometimes use the three primer systems where we have uh, a primer which is in the middle, and if there's kind of a deletion, then this primer cannot bind. Um, but have multiple or multiplex PCR is very common, um, especially in sequencing projects where, for example, you're not only interested in a single gene, but you're interested in like two or three genes at the same time. And you want to amplify these two or three genes and then want to sequence them afterwards. Um, so the application for using multiplex PCR is genome identification. So for example, the, the, the genetic test panel that is being used by the police um, also targets multiple parts of the of the of the genome. And so here, what they what they do is they have a primer mix of 20 uh, known primer pairs, and the distance between these 20 primer pairs is slightly different for every individual. So some individual have a length of uh, 50 between one and two, um, other people have 60, and, and this varies for each of the primer temperatures. So the main design difficulty when you do multiplex PCR is to make is to have to make sure that the melting temperature should be similar for all of the primer pairs that you are using. And of course, the dimer, forma uh, 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 the dimer uh, formation uh, will be much, much um, more common, right? If you have two primers, then the chances of two primers binding together is relatively low. But if you're using 20 different primer pairs, then you have to check each primer against 39 other primers to make sure that they cannot form a dimer. So it's, it's, just, uh, it's just more involved in making a multiplex PCR. But in theory, multiplex PCR is nothing else than just having multiple primers in a single go. So instead of amplifying one part of the genome, you're amplifying two or three or four parts of the genome. And this is very useful for genome identification. A universal primers is, normally primers are designed to amplify one product, but when you are dealing with universal primers, um, you can uh, amplify multiple products. And we call such primers universal primers. And for example, uh, one of the main uh, usages here is to amplify all different human papilloma virus genes. Hey, human papilloma virus, uh, like the flu, um, has very different viral variants. So there's not just one virus, but there's HPV1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, up until like 36, I think. Um, yeah, so you have all yeah, you have all kinds of viruses, which all look very similar, um, um, but they are slightly different. Right, so the strategy here is that you have to align your sequences that you want to amplify, and then you find the most conserved ends at the five and the three prime end. Then you design a forward primer at the five prime conserved region, um, and you do the same thing for the for the three prime end. You match forward and reverse primers to find the best pair, and then you have to still ensure the uniqueness in all template sequences, and you have to ensure uniqueness in positive possible. Com uh, contamination sources. So um, how does this work? Fortunately, I have a board, right? So we have, for example, the human papilloma viruses. And so we have, for example, virus one, which looks like this. And then we have virus two, um, which is very similar, but it has a small deletion in the middle. Right, so when we align it to the first sequence, then there is no sequence in the second one. And then in the third one, we see the same thing, but now it has a bigger deletion at the end. And for example, we want to amplify a couple of these, and then we have to find the region at the beginning, which is shared between all the sequences. We have to find a region at the end, which is shared between all the sequences. And we can then design a primer, a forward primer here, 
in this region and we design a reverse primer here. And of course this primer can bind to all four, this primer can bind to all four, so now we can amplify any of the four HPV viruses that we are interested in. Is that clear? It's, it's just the same, um, but now we're using a single primer pair and we first have to align all the target sequences with each other uh, to find a region or two regions, one region in the front, one region in the back, where we can more or less target our primers. I hope that it's visible actually, otherwise I have to switch to full screen and I, then, then the overlay will kind of get blocked again, but so let's not do that. But that's making universal primers. You have semi-universal primers, um, which is the same, but now you want to have, for example, um, uh, you want to ha only amplify uh, the first six human papilloma viruses, but not the other one. So you don't want to target number seven. And so again, you do the same thing. So you have to align all the all the HPV genes. So you have to align every all of these viral uh, genomes to each other. And then you have to identify a subset that are more similar to each other than the other subset. And so in this case, we want to look at type one to six, and then we want to find the region which is conserved. And then we have to design forward primers here. And so imagine that we would have a third sequence, or uh, we have now one, two, three, and four. So imagine that we have number five, um, which is slightly different. So it might have like a little deletion here, and it might have like a large deletion at this point, right? So what we want to do is we now want to find a region for the forward primer where the first four are similar to each other, but the fifth one cannot be similar to the first four. And so here we are kind of doing the same thing, um, but now we are looking to find a primer um, which is only amplifying the first four. And this quickly becomes very difficult, especially if you want to um, do multiple uh, genes in the same go. So if you use semi-universal primers and you combine this uh, with, for example, a multiplex PCR, uh, then it becomes a real puzzle to figure out where you should exactly target your primers and um, how they should look like to kind of avoid amplifying sequences that you're not interested in. Um, but these are called semi-universal. So the strategy is more or less similar to the universal primers, uh, but now you don't only want to identify the region at which everything is similar, but now the other virus variant should be different at this point. So then you are talking about a semi-universal primer. My favorite primer design is the Gesmer, and the Gesmer design is when you do not have a DNA sequence available. Right, so if, if you are working on a species uh, which no one has been working on before, so there is no um, um, there is no uh, no no template DNA available. You don't have any sequence data available, um, but you you do know that this animal, for example, has a certain protein, and you want to kind of amplify this protein in this unknown species. So here we are using the homology trick again, hey, because we know that, um, for example, uh, hemoglobin is not that different from humans to mice. Um, hey, imagine that we do not have the genome sequence available for mice, hey, then we would use the human sequence for the gene of interest. So for example, uh, hey, like um, uh, hemoglobin, so we use the human hemoglobin sequence, the protein sequence, and then we design primers based on the human hem hemoglobin sequence uh, of the protein, and then we translate that back, right? So hey, in, in, in case we are interested in um, hey, hemoglobin, not only in mice, but in other species which do not have a genomic sequence available. And so what we then do is hey, DNA sequences are unavailable, a single group of related proteins can be back translated into nucleotide sequences and then this will be used as a template to design our primers. Hey, translation from proteins to DNA is possible, but it has its problems because there will be um, there will be slight differences, right? So, um, like I told you guys, every amino acid is coded by a, a triplet, but the last base pair, right? Um, the last base, so this one? No, this one for you guys. I don't know, how does it look on stream? Is this the last one or is this the first one? I don't know, but hey, when you have a three base pair codon, then the third base pair in the codon is called the wobble base, and this is more or less free to choose. Right, because of the way that the uh, um, that the ribosome works, so every 
like third base pair, you could make an error. You could say, well, I'm targeting a C, but the animal that you're looking at is actually coding a T there. And so what you have to do then is to either know the codon bias of the animal, which you probably don't, um, but hey, you can use that to back translate. Um, so hey, we are designing then based on the protein sequence of another animal which we know the protein sequence of, and then we use that, we use the codon table to go back from protein sequence to DNA sequence, and then we design a primer based on this hypothetical DNA sequence. Of course, there might be bugs there, or hey, there might be mismatches, so we have to make our primers longer. Um, hey, so we back translate the protein sequence using the corresponding codon table. Hey, we identify five prime regions and three prime regions where we're most likely to not have made a mistake. And then we design uh, and match forward and reverse primers as before. And But now we, we make our primer around 30 or 35 base pairs long, hey, just to avoid that if there are any nucleotides that do not match, that these mismatches can be can, can still work, right? Because the primer can, if you have a primer which is 30 or 40 base pairs long, and then as long as like uh, 30 out of 40 base pairs bind, um, it is still possible uh, for the DNA to bind, so it's still possible to get a, a, a product. Um, and so um, you use longer primers, not only that, you use a slightly higher annealing temperature, because of the slightly higher annealing temperature, you increase the primer annealing stringency. So it, it becomes a little bit more stringent. Um, but gasmers are really fun to make um, because there's an additional step of going back from, hey, because you go from protein to DNA code and then based on this hypothetical DNA code, you are starting to design your primers. And um, this is an iterative process. So you, you, do, you, you have to do it a couple of times. You're, you're never getting it right in the first go. So, but, but it's very fun to make gasmers. All right, so primers can be designed to serve a multitude of purposes. You can do multiplex PCR, you can design semi-universal primers, you can design gasmers, and there are actually many, many different other strategies to design primers for different different solutions. Yeah, but there's many different fields where primer design skills are required. For example, if you are going to do real-time PCR, um, for example, measuring coronaviruses. Hey, Florian, welcome to the stream. How's it going? Do you have any mood that you want to share? Bad, ah, uh, still bad. Well, we're not going to talk about that, but uh, um, just uh, just throw something. So if it goes bad, then what do we have for that? Um, we have the kind of pensive emoticon for you then. So you can you can throw something like this in chat, and then then you look you look like this. So I'm using the overlay now. Like <laughs> All right, so and there's many different fields where primer designs are, are necessary, um, especially when you work in a lab, um, and then you have to design your own primers. Um, normally for PhD students, um, well, you have to type it in first, uh, Florian. So just, just type in a word with like capital letters like me, like pensive, and then you will be added to the mood box on top of me. <laughs> All right, but many fields for primary design skills are required. So real-time PCR, population polymorphisms, where you target uh, microsatellites or AFLP or SNPs. Um, too old for Twitch. Yeah, I'm too old for Twitch as well, but I'm still doing it. Like. But the basic rule in every primary design that you do, achieve the appropriate hybridization specificity, so make sure that your primer is unique. It can only bind to the DNA of the target species and not of any contamination sources, and make sure that there is enough stability. So make sure that your primer can bind and can bind properly, and that the three prime end is not tightly bound to the DNA, because that's one of the reasons why most primers don't work, is because the primers just bind to the template too strongly for the polymerase to be able to kind of extend the DNA. All right, so searching uh, in databases, um, because hey, of course we, we have to deal with uh, the databases. So hey, databases are uh, genome browsers. Um, hey, we are going to look uh, at Ensemble. Um, how do we find our genomic location that we want to target our primers on? And how are we going to export our sequences? Um, and 
I was initially wanting to do a live demo, but I just put some of the um, screenshots in the slides because yeah, otherwise I have to switch between uh, the Firefox and the normal window. So, and of course, when you want to design primers, you need to be able to figure out what part of the genome you want to target. So you can do this using a genome browser. Um, genome browsers like Ensemble or UCSC, they visualize genetic information, right? So there's, you have a, a genetic sequence and these, this genetic sequence codes for different, um, different, different genes right or different microRNAs and so what a genome browser does is that it takes the genetic sequence and then adds information on top of that sequence saying that well at this region there's a certain gene and here's an exon here's an intron and then there's an exon again and this is the promoter region and so it allows you to use different scales and you can zoom in and out in a genome browser uh, but everything here is based on a coordinate system so the coordinate system that we use in 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 genetics is not fixed in a way and this is a little bit annoying because some genome browsers ensemble the first base pair is base pair number one while in UCSC the first base pair in the genome so on chromosome one base pair one is coded as being zero so and the first thing that you have to remember is that there can always be like a shift in where the, the genome starts but the idea behind a genome browser is just to integrate different information sources. Um, so to have an information source um, like a protein database, which is then incorporated and shown on top of a DNA code, right? So if your DNA code, then you have the, the uh, introns and exons, then you have the protein level on top of that. And when you go to ensemble, this is the way that they present the information to you. So very basically, how does a thing work? Well, you have your lab experiments, which are fed into a computer. Then, of course, you get some textual data or XML or JSON uh, representing your experiment. And people put this data into a database. Um, of course, you don't have one database, but you have many, many different databases like Ensemble, PDB, um, PubMed, um, hey, you have Medlin and all of these databases. So all of these different databases, they have their own web services and you with your lab laptop can use all of these databases or can reach these databases via the different web services um, and so you go to a website and you use it or you use an API so hey, you connect R directly to the database and do queries directly to the database so when you choose a database for your research you have to know the availability and how up-to-date it is so have which organisms are in a database and the ensemble database is for many many different organisms um, but there are databases which are unique to human or which are unique to mouse or which are unique for livestock species um, but you 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 have to when you choose a database for your research you have to make sure that your database is available and that it's up to date and this is one of these things that goes often wrong because hey, in the end we want to have reproducible information and reproducible results and often many databases do not provide access to like the old data sets that they have and so they for example used to have the information based on genome build number five but then they switch to genome build number six and then to genome build number seven but when you publish your paper and when you did your analysis you did that based on genome build number five so the, the database needs to have old versions available, right? So you have to have either a backup of the database yourself to redo your, re, uh, your research, or you have to have a database or a, a, a data provider which has old data sets available. So fortunately, Ensemble is very good in this. So had the Ensemble database, every time that they update their database, they, they keep their old database available and they have like this, this um, structure where you can just say, well, I want to go back to the database as if it were 2016, right? Because then you can redo your, uh, your analysis. Um, in the old days, and that this is becoming less and less important, is that the location of the database was very important. Um, if you are located in Europe, then a database which is located in Japan or in China is of course far away. And especially if you're, 
if you're dealing with a lot of data transfer, right, if you want to download a whole genome sequence, um, then you're talking about like two gigabytes of data. And transferring two gigabytes of data is easier when the database is physically located very close to you. Um, nowadays with uh, things like the Amazon Web Services hey, which are available all over the world the same as Google data centers and hey, this becomes less of an issue because many databases are more or less replicated all over the world um, and um, hey, these these databases are more or less always close to you um, but like five or ten years ago this wasn't that easy so if you would use something like CAG um, nowadays CAG is really really good because hey, you always have a local version which is hosted on a computer more or less in your own country or within your own like zone of the world um, but it used to be that CAC would be only hosted in Japan and then hey, if you would go to the database um, then that would take time and downloading data would be really really slow. So databases when you choose a database you also have to look at which software they have available which analysis tools they have available but in the end choosing a database is more or less um, hey, you have your own personal favorite or your own personal flavor of database that you like. Like I am someone who uses Ensemble a lot, um, but I know a lot of the people that I work with, they prefer UCSC. So that's it. they contain more or less the same data, um, but a different coordinate system um, and slightly different organism. And hey, so your personal flavor and the flexibility of the servers matter when you, when you choose a database. And like I said, you have many different, so hey, you have the UCSC database, which you see here. Um, you have Map Viewer. Um, oh no, this is Map Viewer. Here you see UCSC, and here you see Ensemble. And all of these databases look slightly different. They have very similar information in there, um, but hey, choosing one is very up to you. And you can choose one, and someone else chooses another one, um, but then you run into the issue that sometimes you have slight different coordinate systems. So hey, Ensemble starting with base pair position 1 while UCSC starts with base pair position 0. So hey, that will that will have a gene start at 3000 in Ensemble and at 3, or 2999 in, in, in UCSC. So it, it creates some issues. So Ensemble is the main database that, that I am using, so I will be using that today for your overview. When you go to Ensemble, it kind of looks like this. It doesn't really look like this anymore. They, they change the database, of course, every so often. Um, so when I made a screenshot like two years ago for the first presentation that I did, it looked like this. But the thing is, is that if you, for example, click on a species, so you select the species, you can go to the assembly information and here it will tell you all of the information that you kind of need to know. But the most important information is this line. So hey, here you see the assembly that we're currently looking at. So we're looking at BTAO 4.0, which was published October 2007. So when you are writing a publication and you are saying that we use the ensemble database for Bos Taurus, then you have to add this information to your publication because people need to know exactly which genome version you are working at because genomes get updated not very frequently but frequently enough that you have to mention which version you used because every new genome build will see changes to where genes are located has sometimes the genome becomes a little bit longer um, because people were able to sequence a part which was not sequenced before um, has so you you have to mention the assembly that you're currently or that you are working on when you write a publication and you also generally mention the database version that you used so these two are more or less the most important ones that you have to use in a, in a publication. So when you search in Ensemble, very easy, um, we already did this, you can search by gene symbol, by database ID or position in the genome, and so they, they give some examples here, like you can search for the gene name or you can search for just a single term like prion, and, and searching in databases becomes easier and easier um, because they are more or less, um, and they're getting smarter every day. So Searching by gene symbol used to be a pain in the ass um, because gene symbols are not standardized. They used to not be standardized. For humans, you have the uh, HGNC, so the Human Gene Nomenclature Committee, that assigns names to genes. Um, has so a gene symbol is an approved name, which is approved by the committee for a verified human gene. Um, 
and of course this has a massive a massive advantage so it is a unique reference for all for a genes uh, in, in scientific articles hey you can easily search for a gene in a database and you can actually identify several gene families right if I'm searching for SIP and then a number and then these all point to cytochrome uh, genes if I search for Hox um, which are genes which control like development of different types of body tissue um, and these are all homeobox genes so they are genes in the genome which which kind of shut down another part of the gene um, and it it allows you to clarify orthologous genes in other species this did not used to be the case it used to be the case that a single gene could have up to like 15 different names so someone would call it um, BBS7 um, other people would call it different um, so let me let me just go quickly to ensemble and show you the or not show you but tell you the diversity in a certain gene so and BBS7 is one of these genes that we've been working on a lot um, and so can I show you Firefox yeah there we are um, and so if we look in ensemble for BBS7 let me scale this up a little bit for you guys um, not too much actually um, so here we see um, um, BBS7, right? So it's called BBS7 now, but it used to be called 8430406N16RIK. So this and BBS7 are the same gene. It's now called BBS7 based on the Human Gene Nomenclature Committee, right? Because they decided that all of these beadlet bartlett associated syndromes, uh, associated um, genes, should be called BBS. But it used to be called this, and and this holds for for many genes, and especially genes which have been studied a lot. They sometimes have five or six different names uh, that pop up in literature, and then of course it becomes very hard um, to kind of understand uh, which gene people uh, people are talking about if everyone's using their own name. Um, but that fortunately got better uh, when the human. Um, well, the human community, so the community of human geneticists, came together and decided to form this human gene nomenclature committee. Um, and so it, it has many, many advantages. Um, and so here, when we want to search for a gene, we can, for example, search for ABCG2, um, which is a gene which is involved in milk production in cattle. Um, and so it's called Bostaurus ATP binding cassette. It is located on chromosome 6 in cow, and this is based on the chromosome UM, uh, UMD3 coordinates. So in the Bostaurus 4 genome build, this gene might be located somewhere else. It might be on a completely different chromosome. Um, yeah. uh, the name of the gene is AP, A, ABCG2, um, and in this case they don't have any, any synonyms. So fortunately, just gene only has one name. And so when we search for the gene here on the side, we see all of the different options that we can do. Um, yeah, so one of the things that we can click on is, for example, click on this um, uh, orthologs gene. Right, that will show us the orthologs, so or the, the gene in different species. Um, when you click on that, and then you see here that, that there are many different animals in which this gene occurs. It highlights the gene that we, that we had selected. And you can see that when we look at this ABCG2 gene in cattle, and then the closest known related variant is the, the same gene in sheep. And then the next closest relative is um, in dolphins. So, and Genetically, you would not think that cows and dolphins are very re related, um, but they actually are. Cows and dolphins and cecicians, uh, and like um, um, whales and dolphins, and hey, so all of the uh, mammals who are living in the sea currently, um, they are very closely related to cows. So, and that that's something that you can learn when you when you have a database filled with all of these sequences for different genes and for different genomes. All right, so when we when we look at this ABCG gene and we go back to the main gene page, then you see here that this gene has two transcripts, so there's two different splice variants, right? That means that um, when you click on the show transcript table, you, you get this little overview, and here you see that there are two different versions of the gene. Both code for a protein which is 658 amino acids long, but the length of these genes are different on the genome. So this means that this is a gene which has a uh, which codes for two 
kind of different proteins. They're, the proteins are more or less uh, of similar length, um, but they are not the same proteins. So here we have a situation where in one case a certain exon might be skipped or there might be um, uh, an intron which is included. Um, yeah, so transcripts, so every gene can code for an n number of transcripts. Um, so an n number of proteins that are being made. And so here we see the two different transcripts and so we can see that both of them start more or less at the same position um, yeah, but the first gene actually skips a whole part of the genome and then the first exon is located here while the second version of this gene already has its first exon very uh, much much closer to the gene right so hey we can see that some of the inter some of the exons are shared right so this part is always included into the abcg2 gene however hey, this part is only available in variant number two and it is not available in variant number one and so although they code, it's the same gene coding for two different proteins and these proteins are coded very differently. Uh, but of course there are exons which are shared and there are exons which are unique to one of the two gene variants. So these transcripts, and you can just get them from Ensemble. And so there's a lot more information from Ensemble, so you can go to the external references where you can go to either literature or Uniprot to show the, the protein sequences or the protein domains. Um, hey, you can go to Wikigene, which has some information about the gene in a, in a kind of Wikipedia format. Hey, you can go to genomic alignments, here you see the location of the genome, so you can you can look at the gene on sequence level and then here when you click on this phenotype button then you have the phenotypes which are associated with this gene. And so this is um, the part of ensemble which is built up by QTL analysis, right? Because QTL analysis allows you to associate a region of the genome with a certain phenotype um, and so here there all these associations will be there. And then you go to the variation table to show all of the known single nucleotide polymorphisms inside of this gene. So the Uniprot database, we already saw it before, but the nice thing about Uniprot that it has a very kind of clear description of what the protein does. And so um, had this uh, high capacity urate exporter functions in renal and external urate secretion plays a role in polyform homeostasis, enables to mediate the export of um, PPIX for both from the mitochondria. So it gives you an overview of what the gene is doing. And the known SNPs, um, generally when we are talking about SNPs in the in the in primer design, of course, when we know that there are SNPs in this gene, then we do not want to target a primer at the location where there is a SNP. And so the SNPs that we are most interested in are the SNPs which are the, the missense variants which are changing the protein um, but we also need to account for, um, um, not, or for, um, for standard variants. So, so SNPs, single base pair changes into the genome because this will affect the hybridization of our primer. And we can imagine that if we work on two different species of cows, so I am working on Holstein and someone else is working on um, Rotpontus Fleckvi or, or another uh, cow species, and then of course then the issue comes in is when these two cow species have or cow breeds have very different SNPs, so very different or relatively different sequences, then a primer pair might work in Holstein but it might not work in, in one of the other species. And so when you are designing primers, always make sure that your primers are not targeting a region uh, where there is a single nucleotide polymorphism or where there is a, a known deletion. So, um, and you can find that in the SNP table, um, which is located here in the variation table. All right, so um, if we look at a certain gene, or if we look at a certain SNP, for example this SNP here, then here we can see it is a missense mutation, meaning that it changes the amino acid structure, and then we can use dbSNP to get more information about what is exactly changing. And so when we search for this SNP, um, and so when we want to get the region for a certain uh, gene, uh, for a certain SNP, so imagine that we want to PCR out this part of the genome which has the SNP in there, right, so that we can send it in for sequencing. Hey, um, imagine that Holstein has the reference allele and another cow breed has uh, has got a different allele and then we can target primers to amplify this part of the genome and then by sequencing we could figure out if 
the animal in, in uh, has the Holstein allele or if it has the Rotopontus fleckvi allele. Yeah, so um, we can search for a certain SNP, uh, then we choose the region in detail button, and then we have to verify that the SNP is, is in the picture or uh, that we can see the SNP there, and then we can export the data uh, to a FASTA sequence. Yeah, and now we can use this FASTA sequence to create primers and yeah, to extract this piece of DNA for sequencing or um, other things that we might want to do with it. So if we are designing primers, there is one big disadvantage, and that is that there are repeats in the genome, right? I told you guys that when you, when you design a primer, your primer needs to be unique. Of course, repeats are up to around 50% of the mammalian genome. So if I just look at a, a region in the DNA and I just randomly select like 50 base pairs, then the chances that this 50 base pairs occur somewhere else in the genome is around 50%, right? Because every, every if you just randomly select a part, then there's like a 50% chance that this part will be in the genome twice. And so PCR primers cannot contain repeats themselves um, so and we do not want to target primers in these areas which are repeated so we need to get rid of them and you can use something like repeat masker for that um, nowadays in ensemble you can also just repeat mask it when you export your sequence um, so uh, let's show you guys since all right so hey imagine that we uh, let me make this a little bit bigger so that it fits a little bit better into the screen a little bit more, a little bit bigger here, right? So imagine that we want to um, go for this this one SNP, which was in the presentation. So the SNP was called, um, let me move this to the side so I can see. So the SNP was called RS4370702. Right, so we just search for this SNP, and then here we see that it's a cattle variant. So it's it's a it's a SNP which occurs in, in cows. All right, so we just click on it, and Ensemble is relatively slow at the moment, but here we have the RS SNP, right? So it says that um, the reference genome has an A, and some animals have been detected which have a T. Um, what does it do? It's located at this point in the genome, um, and um, this this um, and this this is the name of the variant, and it overlaps seven transcripts, so it, it does affect the coding of the of this gene, um, of this ABCG2 gene. So what we can then do is, of course, we can now say um, that um, we can now um, export. So we go to region in detail. Um, so where is it? Region in detail. Uh, it doesn't have the region in detail anymore. It's so nice that they changed the database. Um, I think it's now. Yeah, it's probably called genomic context. All right, let's click on it. We have to wait a little bit for the component to load. And then here we see that this SNP is located here. So when we hoover over it, Oh, you don't get the pop-up because it's not capturing the uh, the pop-up. But here at this position, uh, the uh, the SNP is located. Um, so it's um, can we zoom in a little bit? No, we can't zoom in a little bit. No, no, we're not allowed to zoom in. Um, so here we see the SNP located in the middle, and then when we want to go and get the region for this SNP, and then we can go to the primary assembly to the location. Um, and we just click on it here, right? So then we go back to the standard ensemble website and where again it loads in this component that kind of shows where it is located. And so we can see here that here there is this uh, SNP that we were interested in. And just, yeah, so now you see it. So here you see our SNP, right? 43702337. It's located exactly here. And you see also here that there's an overview for all the phenotypes that have been associated through QTL mapping. And so we can see, for example, that this is uh, this this SNP is associated with a difference in milk protein percentage. So having a certain variant of this SNP increases or decreases your milk protein. Um, and it also 
increases or decreases the milk fat right but when we click on it we can see that okay so this thing is in the middle now and so we want to export the sequence here so that we can design two primers to PCR out um, for example this piece of the genome right so we can then go to export data right and then we have to make sure that hey, we, we want to PCR out a, a, a part of the genome and the SNP is located at this exact location so what you would normally do is say well if you do sequencing then you can sequence very cheaply like 200 300 base pairs um, so what we want to do is we want to go like 100 base pairs in front of this one so we say um, oh uh, we go from let me reset that five six so it actually oh no the it's not in the middle um, so it's already in the middle, so it already selected a 100 base pair region uh, where the SNP is located at position number 50. Um, so, but I want to make the region slightly bigger, so I'm going to say, well, go 50 base pairs earlier, yeah, give me not a sequence which is 100 base pairs long, but which is like 200 base pairs long. So I want to start 50 base pairs earlier, and then I want to say 7-4 to be 50 base pairs later. Right, then we say next. And then we say, well, we want to have it in text. And then it opens up a window where we have the primary assembly. Now we have to make sure that we find our SNP in this sequence. Um, and so if we would go back and we would zoom into this SNP, then we would know that this SNP is located at exactly position um, 640. So 640, so that means that it is 100 base pairs um, before the end and a hundred base pairs after so that should be perfectly fine right but we we do want to check that the location here is exactly in the middle of the location here all right so then the next step would be is to now do repeat masking on this sequence so we just copy this sequence and then we go to uh, repeat masker so let me open that up can I just click on it here yep so it here we go to the repeat masking website and we take our sequence of interest that we want to design primers for um, and so we go here we put in the sequence um, and then we say well we want to use um, and the DNA source in this case is um, mammal other than below um, and the sensitivity is going to be default and well we just leave everything in standard. So we just submit the sequence and then hey, it will start repeat masking our sequence. So it will look in this 200 base pair sequence if there are any repeats. Um, and we just have to wait until it finishes. Yeah, so it looks for simple repeats and then have full length and dispersed repeats. So and it just goes through all the possibilities that what, what might not be suitable for primer design. Um, yeah, so it, it takes a little bit. A um, little bit of time, but it shouldn't be too long. Um, so let me refresh it just to make sure. And it says no repetitive sequence was detected. So that's really good. So in this case, this region of the genome has no repetitive sequences. And then here we can go and it says no repetitive sequences. So we can just use the sequence that we have as if um, and because there are no repetitive sequences. Um, but you always have to do this step. You have to make sure that there are no repeats because you, you can't design primers based on the repeats. All right, so then the next step would be to start designing a primer. And because now we have our sequence, we know that our SNP is exactly in the middle. And so that means that the SNP is somewhere around. So this is 60, so then 40 base pairs in. So it's around here where our SNP is located. And so we can design a primer all the way up to where our SNP is, all the way, and so we have a forward primer that we can design here and a reverse primer that we can design here. All right, let's go back to the PowerPoint. And so make sure that you always do the repeat masker step. Um, again, how do, does it work? So you take, oh, I took a thousand base pairs. So let's go back because then I can show you that there are a lot of repeats. So we go to primary assembly, right? We take the location of this SNP um, so here we just go to export data we say we want to have the location of the SNP location of the SNP and we want to have a thousand base pairs upstream and a thousand base pairs downstream around oh no around so we go 500 in front 500 in the back and then we just say next 
and then we go to text. So now we get a much, much longer sequence than before. So we take the much longer sequence. And again, we are just going to first go to repeat masker and make sure um, that there are no repeats. So we just put it in. Uh, other, please specify. No, we're just going to say other than below. So it's a mammal. All right, so we just submit our sequence. It will take a little bit of time, not too long. So. Ah, again, no repetitive sequences detected. Why is that? Because in the original one, why does that not work? Hmm. That's strange, because there used to be a repetitive sequence in here. Did I take another snip compared to the one that I was looking at? Yeah, it might be that the genome build got better. Um, that is interesting. Let me try this once more. So I'm not, I'm not going to use repeat mask, or I'm just going to hard repeat mask this region. Um, so that that should be, and then we could look at text. Yeah, so actually Ensemble does find a uh, repeat, right? So the repeats here are these regions where it says N, 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 N. So it, Ensemble nowadays has its own built-in repeat masker, which is a little bit better than the repeat masker that I point to in the in the slides. Yeah, but here you can see that hey, if we would design a primer without masking the repeats and we would pick a primer which would have been located here, yeah, then of course our primer would not have worked because it would be binding not only this sequence but also other sequences in the cow genome. So let's just use this one then for um, for future reference, right? So again our SNP should be in the middle and of course we need to make sure that we check that as well. All right, so let's go back and um, disable Firefox. So this is what it used to look like when I when I ran it with um, the old version. Um, had then it would take the DNA sequence, and then here you would see that there would be a big repeat, which was also in another place in the genome. All right, so and when we design primers and primer design, you can do by hand. So it is possible to design it by hand, but you can do uh, it much better by a computer. And so a computer is much better at designing primers, and, and there's like things like Primer 3, um, and which is a web application. You have Oligo, which is also a standalone application. And, but there are like literally dozens of tools to do primer design. So and we're, um, you can select any tool that you want, um, and you can calculate the melting temperature using, for example, the Promega uh, calculator to calculate your melting temperature for your primer to make sure that your forward and reverse primer are of suitable temperature. But nowadays, programs like Primer 3 will also do a first prediction of the melting temperature, so we don't have to deal with that. The recording time, yeah, we're at 52 minutes, so I'm just going to continue. Um, yeah, so an example of Primer 3. Um, yeah, we will do that after the break. Um, I guess you're just interested in getting the uh, uh, getting the animated GIFs to cheer up a bit. Um, let me change at least my um, my 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 mood box. Um, so I will be doing this one. Yeah. All right, so I will stop the recording and we will be back in like five to ten minutes. Um, so I will.